Hi, everyone. I'm Veronica Vargas Stidvent, Executive Director of the Center for Women in Law. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the latest installment of our Ex Libra series, in which we host discussions with authors about time, their timely and relevant books. And we're very excited today to have to uh, welcome the authors of Women in Law Discovering the True Meaning of Success. Um, if you have questions for the authors as we get to talking, please post them in the Q&A. For those of you who are just joining us for the first time, the Center for Women in Law is a national resource and champion for women lawyers, generating lasting change within the legal profession. We um, pursue our mission in a variety of ways, including programs like Ex Libris, um, which is made possible by the generous support of our donors, including many of you who are with us today. So I want to Thank all of you for your support. Um, gifts of any amount uh, support our center and our mission and the programs and initiatives um, that advance that mission. So we thank you so much for your generosity. So without further ado, let's meet some of the authors of Women and Law. And they're coming on screen right now. So I'm gonna start introducing uh, our introductions with Talar Herculean Corsi, who serves as general counsel for Vista Ford Lincoln in Woodland Hills in Oxnard, California. She's described as a lawyer by day and a philanthropist by night. She is co-author of the best-selling anthology, Hashtag Networked, and of a children's book, Ralphie's Rules for Living the Good Life. She's also very involved with the Society for Orphaned Armenian Relief, and she has raised tens of thousands of dollars for orphanages in Lebanon in memory of her father. So welcome to Lar. Thank we you. also have with us Jennifer Belmont Jennings. I'm glad you could get the video working. Jennifer is a wealth advisor at Hightower Wealth Advisors, wealth Advisors St. Louis, where she works with individuals and families to build a legacy, developing and implementing financial plans that complement their estate planning and tax objectives. Early in her career, no surprise, Jennifer practiced law um, in estate planning, probate, and family matters, which gives her the perspective to bridge the financial and legal aspects of her clients' lives and to do that very, very successfully. So welcome, Jennifer. Elena Cohn serves as Vice President, Associate General Counsel for Women's Care, a national OBGYN group with practices in Florida, California, and Kentucky. Um, she previously served as General Counsel for Alliance PTP, a national provider of healthcare services, as General Counsel for Dental Partners, and as in-house counsel for DaVita Medical Group. And before moving in-house, Elena was an associate at Schumacher. So welcome, Elena. Tatya Gordon-Troy is the CEO of Ramsey's House Publishing and serves as a writing coach, editor, author educator, ghostwriter, and this is my favorite, all around miracle worker at mm -hmm. Ramsey's. She is the former head of publishing for the American Immigration Lawyers Association, where she was successful at building a multi-million dollar publishing house. Her hashtag is behind the book because she has been the brains behind hundreds of books written by attorneys. So welcome Tatya. Welcome to all of you and thank you for representing the 23 authors of the book. So I wanted to make sure people know that this is an anthology of, of 23 amazing stories. And I hope um, many of your co-authors are joining us in the audience today because um, we would have loved to be able to capture everybody on screen. And so thank you all for joining us. One of the questions on my mind, and I know it was one that I talked with some of you about and one that we've received from our audience is how in the world did this book come about? Because this is uh, an anthology of 23 stories, totally different women from across the country, from across the world. We've got international um, uh, co-authors. How did this come about? And just so everyone knows, this actually happened in the middle of COVID, in the pandemic. So um, Tasha, I'm going to start with you. How, what was the genesis for the book? Oh, wow. Okay, well, really to get down to the nitty gritty of it, um, there was a particular article that was written by a female attorney um, who had been practicing for probably several decades and it happened to be published in the ABA journal. And when that happened, pardon my French, the shit hit the fan because what she was um, basically saying in her article was she was really focusing on what we all know and, and still believe to this day, actually, that our profession is led by men and that if women want to um, succeed in this profession, we basically have to act like the men. 
And she said several things that were somewhat disparaging in terms of trying to be an attorney as well as trying to be a mom. Uh, there were certain things that she just thought, thought were going to be uh, what she defined as success and what the profession defined as success. And when we all saw that, and I mean, a lot of female attorneys were in an uproar when we saw that. And even though we, once we decided we wanted to do a book, we didn't want it necessarily to be focusing on her or her article because it's, it, it, it started a movement in a way, but it also, we didn't want it to be about her. We wanted it to be very um, focused on the alternatives and what we think as personal um, success as well as what others should be thinking in terms of their own success. So we wanted to really focus on um, putting across to people that you are, you define your own success and you also are in charge of your own destiny. And when Angela Hahn, who was one of the art, one of the authors in the book came to me and said that she wanted to do this, um, I didn't hesitate because I have, I'm now, friends with 22 other females who are so successful and so well above my, stat my status, in my opinion, um, that we all came together to do this together. And it's just been a whirlwind of opportunities for us to not only get to know each other, but to build a, a really long and major network of friends and, and colleagues and it's just been really interesting to do. So that's really how it came about. It was sparked by that article. And then we decided people who are coming into this, this profession need to know that they can write their own success, really. And they don't have to be told by other people what success is. They can seriously just define it for themselves and figure it out as they go along. That's great. And I, I love that the book is really inviting people to do that and defining um, success in their own way. And so I wanted to talk with each of you about that in your own past and, and, and maybe starting with you, Talar, because your story uh, talked about, and I think this is very common um, amongst uh, women and particularly first generation uh, grads and, and attorneys and particularly immigrants about family expectations. And the definition of success when we're talking about not only what the profession uh, uh, defines and prioritizes, but what our family wants us to do. And by family, I mean our parents and the people who are coming before us. So Talar, can you speak to that about the challenges of defining success when you feel the weight of other people's expectations on you? You know, it, it boils down to this joke that my husband and I have. Um, when I was growing up, I hated ginger, but my mother insisted that I liked ginger. And so that pretty much encompasses what much of my childhood and early adulthood was like. I was never asked, you know, do you like this or do you want to do this? Um, I was told what I would like and what I would do that. Um, I would go to UC Irvine instead of UCLA, that I was going to be a lawyer instead of a teacher or an actress, which was my first choice. And, um, you know, as you said, I'm, I'm an immigrant. I'm not even first generation. I was born in Beirut, Lebanon, raised in Saudi Arabia. Um, you can imagine I didn't have very many female role models in Saudi Arabia. Um, and I really didn't even have that after immigrating to the United States and um, really just had to figure everything out on my own. But even though I had the ability to, to figure things out, navigate, you know, the U.S. college system, academic system, trying to find a job, I never stopped to consider whether this is what I wanted. And you know, the aha moment really didn't happen <clears throat> until after my father died in 2006. I had started um, seeing a therapist because he had gotten stranded in Lebanon during a war. And I, I was depressed and I was anxious. And um, so I started to go see a therapist. And 
one of the things she uh, said to me, she said, don't you fight for a living? And I said, well, yes, I guess so. I'm a litigator. She goes, you don't strike me as a confrontational person. And I thought, I'm not. I really don't like conflict. <laughs> and that was my aha moment. Um, my dad, you know, unfortunately died shortly thereafter. And I, I, I kid you not, I, I saw him alive for 12 hours. I was able to make it there uh, to Lebanon during a war. Trying to get him home uh, was not successful because he died there. And one of the last things he asked me on his deathbed was, have you made partner yet? And I said, no, dad, I, I haven't. I did make partner two months later. Um, he wasn't there for it. As you can imagine, it was a very bittersweet experience, but you know, that was a part of me realizing this was never for me. This isn't something I ever wanted. And um, for the first time in my life, started asking myself, what do I want? What makes me happy? What does success look like for me? And I can be impulsive in a lot of ways, especially when it comes to buying yoga pants. I can never have too many yoga pants. Uh, but when it comes to job transition, if you look at my work history, I've had three jobs post law school graduation. I do not make a move quickly or impulsively. It took four years from that aha moment to when I actually made the jump to go in-house to where I am now, um, because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't throwing the baby out with the bathwater, which is a horrible analogy. And I'm sorry, just as the words left my mouth that I even said that, but I couldn't think of anything better. I wanted to really figure out what I wanted. And, and a part of that struggle was things that I was really good at and I was excelling at at the firm were things that I didn't necessarily like to do. Even though I was a good litigator, I didn't enjoy it. I, I didn't enjoy that process. And so it took years of distilling what, what I really wanted and what I really liked, which was really hard for me because like I said, it, I was what, 31 years old, 32. And I'd never asked myself those questions before. And um, I wish, I keep saying this and I won't stop saying it. I wish there was a book like Women in Law when, you know, whether I was in high school or college or, or law school, and I think it can really speak to um, all professions, is the process that the, each one of us took in discovering success for ourselves and what that meant and what it could look like. I, I didn't have those images when I was going through the process. There was just really one set path, and that was the one that I took. Uh, but I have now taken a few detours. I have added some accessories um, and I couldn't be happier. Thanks, Laura. And Elena, um, you have a, a somewhat similar background that you were not born in the United States. And, um, and your story talks about uh, your formative years and in, in the collapse of the Soviet Union and how that shaped um, some of what, how you define success. And I, I also want to point out, um, I was reading, a, I'm sorry, a truncated version of your bio. And so you are the Associate Regional Chief Legal Officer at Advent Health. And I want to make sure that I say that and get that right. Um, so for you, Elena, I was struck, I, I loved in, in your story, you talk about a couple of superpowers that people may not think about. And one was because English was your second language, that was a huge advantage actually in law school because you were you were paying far more attention to the words and the language than maybe native speakers were. And then later on in your career, you talk about um, how uh, becoming a parent made you a better lawyer. So you, can you talk about that? Because I think that turns on its head some of the assumptions we normally have about um, advantages and disadvantages and what makes people a good good lawyers and good Good, good professionals. Absolutely. Um, first of all, I think it's a lot of it depends on your self-awareness and kind of also noticing the people around you. Yes, English is not my native language, as you can hear from my accent. And it took me years and years to fall in love with my accent. I did not like it at first. I wanted to get rid of it. Uh, but I realized my accent is never going away anywhere. 
Uh, and I kind of started enjoying it because I can call my physician's office and they know immediately, oh, Elena, how are you? How are you doing? So I almost feel like a celebrity, you know? Uh, so uh, it's, it took years of distilling, as Talar pointed out, and I just want to quote her right back to her because I think it's so important. Like with everything else, you know, are you um, happy at the job you're currently at? Is this a good fit for you? And it comes down to self-awareness. You know, you want to evaluate your surroundings. You want to evaluate what people you're working with. You want to evaluate yourself as well to determine, is this truly my definition of success? Just because success looks this way um, within the profession, you know, does this really fit you and your personality? And, you know, take your time, don't make any rush decisions. But if success doesn't look like this for you, then, you know, make a change. And Ronnie, to your point, what are my superpowers? Yes, looking up every word that I don't speak or understand, um, learning $25 words like telemosinary, right? <laughs> you never hear people use those words, but I know what they mean, right? Um, being a mother it was definitely my superpower in law school because it was time spent away from my child from being with him so I spent every moment of every day when I was in law school studying and perfecting you know my skills um, so that later I was in position to uh, get that big law summer associate position and you know follow that route um, but yes to Katya's point about how the book came about we were just so outraged that somehow being a mother could be considered anything but your superpower that we decided to write positive stories portraying our path as women in law and mothers you know and that's how the book came about. Thanks, Elena. And Jennifer, um, I, when I read your story and um, and how you came to be in, in the financial industry, I thought that was was fascinating and a, a good reminder that we all um, have control over our destinies. We think about our path, and then there are the the variables that we have no control over. The, the legal market conditions when we graduate from law school. Um, you know, when when I graduated law school, I had the benefit of of um, a huge tech bubble that was going on. It was it was a wonderful time to be graduating from law school. Jennifer, folks in, in your year did not have the benefit of that. It was a, a tough time to be looking for a new job. So can you speak to that and about how you navigate those conditions when you can't control them? And, and your story was great because um, I think underlying all of it is some optimism that gives people some hope who are struggling with some things they, they may not be able to control um, and, and, and being able to overcome that uh, in the end. So can you talk a little bit about your story? Yes, um, so I was the last class to go into law school thinking it was a good idea. <laughs> like halfway through, it was like, hey everyone, you're not gonna have jobs. And if you do, it's gonna be a, you're not going to get paid anything. You'll practically have to pay to have somebody give you a title to work somewhere. But um, so that is not what I expected. You know, I went to a, a not an inexpensive law school. And my thought was, if I make even at the low end, I'll live with my parents who I didn't ask if I could do that. You know, I just assumed they'd let me live with them. And um, I'd pay my loans off and I'd be done. And when um, the financial crisis hit and it was so hard to find a job and I wanted to stay in St. Louis. That's where my family was. I just gotten married my over like the holiday break of my three L year. Um, there, there were not opportunities. I mean, people were having offers rescinded from big firms and they were deferred and, and I was fortunate to get a job, um, uh, and then I was laid off and due to the economy, they were like, you can keep coming in if you want. We just can't give you a paycheck anymore. And then I found a job at a boutique law firm and I, I did enjoy the work. I liked doing estate planning and I liked doing probate. Um, family law, you know, as Talar mentioned, being good at litigation. I mean, I was good at it. I did not love it. Uh, I had terrible anxiety before I would go to court and 
I would do fine. I don't think anybody knew that I did, but I would be so stressed. And it wasn't because I was afraid to be in court. It was because I couldn't control the other side. I could control my client for the most part and say, hey, you got to love your kid more than you hate your ex or I'm not going to help you. But I couldn't control the system just the way things work. And I, there were just some really horrible things that happened. And I had a nine month old at the time and I was incredibly stressed out, burned out. And my husband was like, this can't go on your friends who are this stressed out. At least they're getting paid. You know, you get your $5,000 deposit and then $20,000 in legal fees later, nobody's paid you a dime, you know? And so amazing how that happens. People always assume, oh, you make a lot because you bill, you can bill all you want, but if someone's not writing the check to pay the bill, it doesn't really matter. But um, so, but at that time it was 2013 and the legal market was still really tight. So I was competing with people who had 10 years more experience than me at, for jobs. I mean, it was, it was brutal. And I, you know, my self-esteem took a hit. There was some like anger in there and, you know, like just questions of faith, like, I felt like God was like out to get me, you know, and, um, why, why wasn't this so easy? And, um, I started to have to think outside the box. I was like, you know what? I can't, I, I can't do what I want to do right now. And so I thought about going into compliance and, th- you know, like what are some jobs that lawyers can do? And I asked a friend of mine, her dad worked at a big financial firm thinking he'd know someone. And he thought, Hey, you know, this might be a good fit for you because you have this estate planning background and your lawyer and the family law, this stuff really intertwines with the financial stuff. And so I thought, heck, I'll give it a try. Uh, I was a little apprehensive because I feel like um, I joke about this sometimes on LinkedIn. I feel like I have like the financial advisor disadvantage. You know, if you connect with me, um, you think I'm going to like pitch you and try to get your money. And I, and I didn't want that that stigma. I mean, you know, you've got the lawyer stigma, right? Like the ambulance chaser. And then I moved to like something else. Right. And, um, so I was hesitant, but I was assured I wasn't going to have to do that kind of eat what you kill kind of thing. And, and I, it was hard. I'm not going to lie. So I first transitioned into more of an assistant role while I got my licenses. And I remember my first day at the office having to like bind these portfolios. I was binding things. Like I went from having somebody who who bound my stuff for me and, you know, sent my mail to being the one who did that. And it was hard. And I kind of wanted to cry that first day. And I felt like here I had done everything I thought was right. And here, and here I was, but, um, you know, it was a great, great learning opportunity. And actually I think I'm better at this role because I did that role. I understand more of the mechanics of how all the operations and how things in the background work, but I, it became clear that I was going to need to move on if I wanted to grow. And that was hard. That's where the bulk of my struggle really took place was looking in like 2018, because I thought, am I going to go back to practicing law? So I was talking to law firms. I was talking to trust companies, um, law firms where I felt like I was going to have a good quality of life. Don't pay as well as, you know, some of the really big firms, but I was also almost 40 thinking, do I really want to have to put my time in now? Like if I was 30, I could do this, but I'm not sure I want to have to do the whole, I get an email at 10 PM on Sunday that something's got to be done on Monday at seven. Um, and so it took a while and I was not happy. Um, (laughs) that's just the nice way to put it. I I was, you know, down in the dumps and I felt really defeated and I felt like I was doing everything I could. I had like that victim mentality, like the why me? And then you you try to like say, but I know I don't have it that bad. Like a lot of people have it worse than I do. And, um, and it, you, but it takes, you know, it really takes a hit at you because you feel like you have all this stuff to offer. I was like, I have all this stuff to offer. I'm good at my job. Why can I not find the right thing? And then interestingly, through all of my networking and the jobs that didn't work out, the people would give my name to somebody else. It wasn't like, I don't like you. I don't want to hire you. It was like, I don't, we can't afford you, or we don't think it's going to be the right fit right now, but you've got to talk to this person uh, because I think you'd be a great fit at this, at this firm. And um, so finally my name got around enough and I got brought into the office with these two women who are, you know, 
there's not very many women with what I do. You think the legal industry is underrepresented financial, like it's like, there's no lines in the ladies room ever when I go to a conference. Um, it's nice, but like, it's not, that's not a good thing. But, um, so I really, I found, you know, I, it happened kind of after I had this moment where I was like, I can't control any of this. I can only control my attitude. I, I can't, I know that sounds so cliche, but sometimes you have to just get to that point on your own. You can have people tell you that you can have your mom tell you that you can have your spouse tell you that, but sometimes you just have to get to that moment where you're like, I'm doing everything I can. And I am making myself miserable. My own self-centeredness is literally making me miserable. And, um, I've got to start thinking about other people and not just think about myself all day long. Cause it's just, it's, it sucks the life out of you. And, and, um, I've even read my own chapter in the book again, to like remind myself of that at various times over the last few months. But, um, so I, when I made the decision, like, okay, I'm doing everything I can, something's going to come along. I'm showing up to work every day. I'm taking care of my clients. I'm learning everything that I can. And I am just not going to be upset. I'm just not going to be that person anymore. And it was a huge weight that lifted off me. And I, when I finally got where I am now, I was really able to look back and see how all of the pieces really fit together and were building blocks. And it was more of a refinement process than anything. You know, like I, I feel like I'm better at my job because of these things. It doesn't mean it's easy when you go through it. You know, ask me in six months when I have like a valley or something, or I'm not where I want to be, or I'm not partner yet or whatever, but, but it's true. It, it is a building block. And I think when you shift your thinking, it will help you like just getting into the like victim self-centered mode is it, you, it, it's destructive and other people can see it. You may not think that they can see it, but they can sense it because you're not an enjoyable person. I mean, I wasn't like this horrible person to be around, but I wasn't, I wasn't like adding life and excitement and like, you know, I felt like I was a little more of a, a downer, you know, and that it's just, it's, it's easy to do it. And that, you know, so, um, lots of good learning opportunities. And I think, as you pointed out, it's like, I've had so many people reach out saying I've gone through really tough times and I'm like, okay, well, you know what? I'm not going to let this go to waste just because it looks like you have it all together on LinkedIn or Instagram does not mean everything happened like in perfect sequential steps. And, and, and it was all, you know, roses and chocolate the whole time, you know, it's like, it, it, it's, it's zigzaggy. So, <laughs> well, I want, I want to follow up on a couple of things you mentioned, which were uh, things going to waste and, and building blocks. And so Tatcha, uh, your story is great about law and journalism and how those worlds intertwined for you. Um, and you have, a, a, I think, a great section that talks about when people question going to law school or question making changes. And I hear this quite frequently from people who say, well, if I change practices in my wasting all those years I spent cultivating clients or building up that area of expertise, even though I really want to try something new. And, and Tachi, you have a, a great thing about um, when people question, for example, law school, that you would never question that, even though you may not be practicing law, because um, you say law school brought out the person I never knew existed. So can you talk a little bit about your pathway and pivot and, and how that fits into this, these ideas? Yeah, um, I, everybody who, who's been to law school, and I'm sure you ladies can, can uh, attest to this too, is, you know, it's, it's expensive, especially today. It's expensive. Um, some people will find it boring. Uh, there's the Socratic method that probably will never go away. Uh, there are different reasons why we all have had, you know, issues with law school and why we probably question whether we sh should even be going to law school. But I know how I was when. Okay, well, we're going to wait for Tatya to jump back in um, and we'll, we'll pick up where she left off on that story because I, I, I do want to get, um, get that uh, perspective. But Jennifer, you also talked about networking. So I'm curious. Uh, let's start with you, Talar, about the power of networks and um, how that impacted um, how you chose your pathway and, and the decisions that you made. 
Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, going back to uh, as far as my career and and being able to get to where I am now, I owe so much to my mentor, James McDonald. He is still at Fisher and Phillips. And he hired me when I was 18 years old as a file clerk. I still remember what I was wearing, um, which is how I first got introduced to Fisher and Phillips. And I stayed all four years during college and worked at Fisher and Phillips. Um, I came back after my first summer. And then I later went to a small insurance defense firm because honestly, uh, I couldn't go back to Fisher and Phillips. I, I I thought that's where I would be going. And I called Jim and um, I said, I need a job <laughs> because I'd sent out all these different letters. I'd done all the OCI and nobody wanted to hire me. And confession to all of you, I graduated law school with a 2.99999, okay? I did not have the 3.0. And uh, I would like to believe that that is the only reason that nobody wanted to hire me, but whatever. So I called Jim and I said, I, I need a job after law school to pay all these student loans back because apparently you're supposed to pay them back. Public service announcement. It's not yours to keep. Um, and he said, I'm sorry, but it's, it's not going to work out. And, you know, it, it's it's funny how it works out. It wasn't until years later that I really found out why the true story, there was litigation involved. There was a lot of political drama, but there was a partner at the firm that I had rubbed the wrong way. Um, and he had shut that door for me at that time. However, I stayed in touch with Jim. And even after he said, no, you can't come back to the firm. I said, well, can you give me some ideas? And he made an introduction to a lawyer that they used as co-defense counsel in employment discrimination cases, small insurance defense firm. She had only one other associate in her department. They didn't have a job opening. None of my jobs that I've gotten after law school were based on a job opening. There were jobs created for me. Um, and that's what happened with her. I mean, I will tell you this, my starting salary, she did end up, you know, convincing her husband, who is the managing partner to create an opening for me because she wanted me. I started at $45,000 a year. That, that's what I was making, but it was better than nothing. And it was doing what I wanted to do at the time, which was the, um, management side employment law. A couple of years later, my parents, lost their lease to the restaurant and I was their 401k because they had depleted their savings when we immigrated. And again, I never thought twice, of course, I'm going to support my parents. I couldn't do it at $50,000 a year. And so I started looking for work. And one of the, you know, I think it was Jennifer was saying, you make the best of it. At the time I thought, oh my gosh, this is horrible. When I was at the insurance defense firm making $50,000 a year, but I will tell you this, during those two years, I got so much experience. I, you know, had second chaired my first sexual harassment arbitration within months of becoming a lawyer. I had already taken dozens of depositions. I had relationships with clients. I, the experience that I was given, I don't, I really don't think I would have gotten anywhere else. And as a second year now looking for more money, I had become a lot more valuable than I thought. So I called up Jim McDonald again and I said, I, I need more money. I need a better paying job. Do you have any leads for me? And I wasn't calling him with the intent of asking him to come back to Fisher and Phillips because I thought that door has been shut. I wasn't trying to open it. I was just reaching back out to my mentor uh, for him to make another introduction this time to somebody who was willing to pay me more money, hopefully. And I was surprised and he, when he said, would you consider coming back to the firm? And I said, I, I thought that wasn't a possibility. He said, well, things have changed. And I said, well, yeah, I would consider it. And so I went to interview with the uh, main office in Atlanta on my birthday in 2000. No, what year was it? I can't remember what year. It was a long time ago. And I went back to Fisher and Phillips and um, 
So, you know, it wasn't social media. It wasn't cocktail parties at the time. My networking at that time was basically continuing to maintain relationships with my mentor. And even after I thought a bridge had been burned to, you know, still keep going back and, and nurture the relationship and not be bitter about it. Um, I mean, since then, networking has taken a different approach, but I have a feeling that I may be done talking right now so that someone else can get a chance to talk. Uh, you, you raised some interesting issues, and I, I want to hear more about mentoring and networking from the rest of the group. Um, but Tatcha, I want to welcome you back. Thanks for, for jumping back in, and I hope we can pick up where we left off with you um, about this idea about um, changing direction and not feeling like it's wasted time or wasted investments, and uh, whether it's changing jobs, changing careers, changing practice areas. Um, so if you could talk to that, because you your story is a great story about you found a love of journalism and, um, and writing and all of these things that maybe people who enter law school aren't thinking about immediately. So can you mm. speak to that? I'd be happy to now that I'm back in. <laughs> the weirdest thing was that another, another meeting kicked me out of your meeting and pulled me into that meeting. <laughs> so I, it's never happened before, but of course it would happen today, right? Um, okay, so yeah, when I was, I, I put myself through college and by doing so, I was, I was working in accounting. Um, thought I was going to pretty much make a career out of that. So when I graduated from, from college, I figured, okay, let's go for the MBA, let's go for the CPA. I was fairly comfortable with where I was in terms of, of that type of job, even though deep down, there's nothing great and to be said about working in accounting. It's nothing, you know, you don't write home about that, but um, it was comfortable. And I guess that was my problem because I had grown up as a shy child. I was very shy when I was very young. And so this, this type of position was meant that I could sit, you know, and not have to deal with people. I'm just crunching numbers. I'm really, you know, it's really that type of thing is very independent. And so I really didn't think I needed to do much more than that. And yet at the same time, part of me was saying, Tasha, you know, you can do more than this, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I just didn't know what that would be. So I sort of just kept it comfortable. And an uncle of mine saw that I had graduated from college with a 3.8. And he said, so what do, what do you have in mind? What are you thinking about doing after this? And I said, I'll probably get my CPA and go on, maybe get my MBA or something. He said, well, have you ever thought of law school? And I looked at him and I said, no. <laughs> like, what is law school? What are you talking about? So he just, he mentioned it. And from that point on, I said to myself, let me look into this. Let me see what this is all about. And it just became more and more intriguing as I, as I learned more about it. Um, before I knew it, I was applying for law schools and got in, got accepted. And it literally just took me on a totally different path. It took this, this inner shy child turning into an adult at that point and still being somewhat shy to someone who was now on like center stage for the most part, because we all know what we have to do when we go to law school. We're in front of judges, we're in front of our professors, we're in front of our colleagues and, and other students doing things. And that went so, that was so different from what my personality had been and it pulled something out of me and made me realize that I was much more than what I was giving myself credit for. And I really do credit law school for doing that because it sent me on a totally different path. People had told me over the years that I had pretty good writing skills and I didn't really take it seriously. But we get into law school and all we're doing is writing. But then, you, you know, you got the school newspaper and then it, they're looking for op-ed pieces. And I said to myself, hmm, why don't I shoot something over there and see if it, it can get published? And I did. And I really received a lot of kudos for it from other professor, professors in, in other um, parts of the, of the college and everything. And it's, it just made me think twice about what it is I wanted to do with my life moving forward. Now, granted, when you go to law school, everybody thinks you're going to be a lawyer. 
And I actually thought that too, but there were things going on outside of law school that made me realize that I could do something more than just practice law. So at the time, the OJ Simpson trial was on, um, on TV live. And I was simply watching what all the legal pundits were doing every day. You watch a bit of the trial and then you go to CNN or, or whomever and you watch them come together and discuss the issues and break it down for the audience. And I said to myself, I can do that. I can do that. So from that point on, I was on a mission. I was, when people were going to, to, to their law classes, I was going across the, the up, up the highway on to another college to take journalism classes and then coming back in the afternoon to take my law school classes. And then they were out getting their internships with law school, I mean, law, law practices. And I'm looking for jobs at the local news station. So it was just like, where are you going with this? And I said, I have a plan. I don't know where this is going to take me, but I have, I have an idea where I want to go and what I think I can do with this. And when I graduated from law school, I got the opportunity to um, interview with Court TV in New York. Went all the way to New York, sat down with them. They offered me a position and I knew it was going to be entry level. But at the time, I just had no idea. And I know Talar mentioned this too about, about salaries. Um, that particular industry didn't pay well back then and they probably still don't. So when they offered me a full-time position in New York for $25,000, I said to myself, you know, I can't possibly consider doing that because you're not paying enough. And I really wish if you were paying more, I jumped at the chance, but it was the, the thought of trying to figure out how to live off of $25,000 in New York. It just didn't work out well. So I ended up coming back to Baltimore, um, landed a position with a local legal newspaper, really just started cutting my teeth in so many places and just doing so many, so many, so much writing and just getting better and better with everything that I was doing. And other people started noticing me. So I'm out and I'm reporting and interviewing people and I interview Congressman Elijah Cummings twice. And he, he really got to know me just based on what I was doing for covering his, his, um, his events. And before I knew it, he was offering me a job as his press secretary in DC. So I jumped at the chance, went down to DC, probably never had a moment of, 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 um, of peace because he was such a busy person and he was really just starting out it was nonstop. I was doing so much writing, whether it was speeches, press releases, research papers, everything. And that really made me realize that this is something, it's just going somewhere. It's really going somewhere. And I just kept at it and kept at it. And things just started happening. I left there. I got another position. It just started going up and up and up. And then finally, I landed um, an editor position with the American Immigration Lawyers Association in DC. And they wanted me to help build their publishing program. And I was just such a great fit for that because I had done so much and I was, I was just open to learning so much more about publishing and media and communications. And I, just, I spent 15 years there building their program and, and getting it to a point where it was more than $4 million a year by the time I left. So at that point, I realized, you know, if I can do it for them, I can do it for me. And that's when I started my own business. But I still do some lawyer work and I've actually worked for a law firm during that period of time. But even when Jennifer was saying, and I can identify a lot with what Jennifer was saying about, um, just not being a good fit for litigation. I tried my hand at it for about a year and a half. And the parts of it that I enjoyed were um, that, that adrenaline rush that comes along with it. But I think that's also the part that really started to wear me down because I got tired of the adversarial aspect of it. And when you keep coming across other attorneys who 
go out of their way to sort of like hammer you instead of really trying to work together, it, it wears you down. It, it burns you out really quickly. So that sort of turned me away from litigation and got me back on track with publishing and, and media. And I jumped onto that and never looked back at this point. I never looked back. And so I now have a, a, a flourishing publishing company of my own and I work with attorneys. That's probably the majority of my clients at this point. Um, and I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed everything that I do and everything that I've done. And I, I, I see how everything that I've done has, has come to this, has brought me to this, has um, really gotten me to the point where I enjoy working with those folks with, and, and we talk shop all the time. And the only thing is I don't have to worry about writing the briefs and the complaints and having to go to court. So that's the good part about it. I get to talk shop and not have to do the work. Thanks, Satya. We have a question from the audience directed to any of you. And I think maybe, Elena, why don't we start with you? It's about what would you do differently? And Elena, I'm starting with you because um, you were very intentional uh, about wanting to go to law school. You were very intentional about how you were going to succeed in law school. And you, you did. And you were recognized by your law school with a, an award given not only to one uh, graduating student a year. And so I want to say, and, you know, as you set up that path for success, um, would you change anything? So let's let's start with you, Elena, and, and, and then we everyone else can, can jump in. What would you do differently? It's an excellent question, right? And, um, you know, when you look back at it, you kind of think about it, you know, what would I have done differently? And, you know, my parents didn't want me to go to law school. Um, where I was growing up in the Soviet Union, connections were really important and they really mattered. And my parents didn't have any connections in the legal department of this university. And they told me, hey, we have uh, connections within the linguistics department, so you're going to be a linguist. And, you know, you do what your parents tell you. So I can really relate to what Kalar was saying and to her story. And so um, I went to college and I became a linguist and I can speak Norwegian fluently, which is not a very useful skill, right? You can't make any money speaking Norwegian. They all speak beautiful English, right? Um, so then when we moved to England and during my first uh, immigration, when I was really on my own and kind of pulling away from the influence that my parents had over me, I decided, you know what? I always wanted to be a lawyer. There are so many reasons for it uh, that I'm not gonna go into, but I said to myself, I wanna be a lawyer and I wanna go to law school, which is what I did. I had this really um, strong desire to be a lawyer. And I think it really helped me throughout law school because as Katya mentioned, and I think every other panelist mentioned, law school is not a walk in the park, right? It's a, it's a challenging experience. And so the burning desire to be a lawyer really motivated me and really helped me um, to then get a position with big law. And then by all means, right, I was a success. I was in big law, isn't it what it's all about, right? Um, but I was working really long hours and I wasn't having much client contact, which I'm um, a team player. I love being integral to a business. That's where I thrive. So a lot of it is about self-awareness, right? Does litigation work for you? No, it doesn't. I wasn't doing litigation, but does the big law mentality and lifestyle work for me? And I looked around and I looked introspectively and I decided for myself, you know what? That's not my definition of success. It could be the industry's definition of success. And by all means, you know, People who work in big law are extremely knowledgeable, smart, super successful, inspirational. You know, there's so many things you can say about them. But for me personally, it wasn't what was working well with my personality fit. And so I decided to explore in-house counsel opportunities, which is where I've been now uh, for a long time. And I'm really thriving and I'm really enjoying it. And I think a lot of it depends on knowing yourself and knowing what works best for you and going for it. Can anyone else do something differently? You have something on the top of your top of mind, Jennifer? I can mention, I, my, I want to say, yes, there are things that I would do differently because going through the valleys really 
it wasn't fun. But at the end of the day, I know this is going to sound like I'm making this up and I'm, I want to be like a motivational speaker or something, but I really would have just changed my attitude faster and gotten on board with making the best of the situation. Because when I look back now, yes, it would have been great if I came right out of law school and I had like the huge six figure salary, got my loans paid off and everything. I think about the role that I play now and how I am helping women lawyers and lawyers. Um, you do not learn about money stuff in law school and also being a mom who has done the litigation thing and you see how like overwhelming and big like financial stuff is, like you have one day job and it's it's hard, to, you can't do everything. And so I am now, you, I'm not allowed to say unique for my compliance people. I am now in a small minority, very, very small of women, lawyer, certified financial planner, designation, um, financial, you know, advisors out there, they're just very small amount. And I work with a lot of lawyers. And I think that's helped me work with lawyers because I can I, I get it and help them in an area that, you know, I wouldn't have understood all of that stuff if I hadn't have shifted. And so I think I'm still really getting to to be part of the legal community and do all these things. It just looks different than how I anticipated it, but I feel like I get to add something to the community as a whole that I wouldn't have been doing had I just kind of stayed that path that I thought I was going to do. So really it kind of shows that your I that idea of success, that idea of what you want to do can change. You don't have to just pick something right at the very beginning. And it's like, if you don't make it, you're not this failure. Um, again, I have doubt moments all the time, right? You know, it happens. Like if my LinkedIn post doesn't do that great, I'm like, what's wrong with me? But like, um, I really get to do something pretty cool and I'm still helping women and lawyers and I'm just in a different position to do it. It just looks different than how I envisioned it. So I would have just gotten my act together a little sooner and stopped felt feeling so sorry for myself. Like the world was out to get me because I, I wasted a lot of time that I could have been making myself smarter or like networking more, you know? So that's my little bit. Thanks. Katja, do you have something to add? I do. And I can really identify again with what Jennifer was saying too. It's, you know, you find your, what you're good at and law school helped me do that. It helped me zero in on things that I hadn't paid any attention to before. Yes, I was a good writer, but I wasn't paying any attention to that. Um, but that made me realize that you can do more with your law degree as well. And it helps me in what I do by being a lawyer too, because I do deal with lawyers. I know exactly what they're dealing with uh, when it comes to their books. A lot of them are focusing on the practice of law, um, the, the, uh, the field of law that they're practicing in. So I understand it. I help them with the research. I can do different things that I wouldn't necessarily be able to do if I weren't already a lawyer and, and understanding what they're doing and what they're going through. Um, but yeah, I don't think I would change anything because I credit law school to, to so much of bringing out the best of my personality and, and putting me on a path that has made me happy and successful. Thanks, Talar. Anything you, if you had to redo, anything you would you would change? I would have bought Apple stock a long time ago. Me too. And um, I would have gotten a financial advisor because I went to UC Hastings thinking I am paying in-state tuition, and so I am saving money. I was living in San Francisco in an oversized closet for $700 a month. Um, so my cost of living was really high and I had a lot of student loans, but you know, the, one of my great inspirations, I'm a groupie. I follow Jesus, Brandon Flowers, Eckhart Tolle, Brene Brown, and Glennon Doyle. And what Eckhart Tolle says um, really resonates with me. And, and this is how I would answer your question. Would I change anything? No, because everything that happened 
happened exactly the way that it was supposed to. Why? Because it did. <laughs> you know, it it did, and uh, I could go back and you know try to pick apart all the things I would have done differently. But I I don't think that it would serve me. What serves me is believing that everything happened the way that it was supposed to because I am here now and I'm exactly where I want to be. Um, so that is my truth. That's great. And it, it kind of brings up a question on my mind too. When we started the conversation, we talked about encouraging people to define their own success and to create their own destinies. And what I'm hearing a lot from the panel too is um, a lot of that's a reaction to things that have the unexpected. So how much of this can actually be deliberate and intentional and planned? And how much of this is about the flexibility to be um, adaptive, to evolve and to question ourselves and our own assumptions? So um, it's that distinction between, uh, you know, um, let's say for example, uh, being deliberate and accepting the serendipitous, so to speak. So, so what do you think about that? I think I, well, I, first of all, I don't know if you're asking me, but I'm going to answer the question anyway. Um, I think that, and, and Eckhart Tolle, I, I don't get paid. I should get paid, but I don't get paid. He talks about this at length in his book, The Power of Now, um, because there is that, this assumption that if you just accept everything that is, then you're not being deliberate or you're not being ambitious. But the two can coexist. It's something that, you know, only in recent years I am learning. The only thing I have control over is myself and my reaction and my response. Um, I cannot control, you know, the circumstances outside of me. And so it's a combination really of the two and recognizing and believing that you do have that power. Um, to Jennifer's point, the victim mentality, I've been there, I've done that, I have, you know, swam in um, poor me. And it, it really does start with what you believe. If you believe you are a victim, then you are and you have no control. But you but if you believe that you do have control over your, your own reaction and your own mindset, then that is exactly what you will do. I don't know if that made any sense, but I might know that does. And, and yeah, coffee. um, I think, I think that's helpful. And Tati, do you have something to add? I know she came off mute. Um, well, I don't have a whole lot to add, but I do want to say that, you know, it's when you figure out what your skills are, what your strengths are, then you have a better sense of where you can go with them. And sometimes it takes us, sometimes it takes longer, some people longer than, than others to figure that out. Um, but it's, it's a matter of not ignoring what, what you're good at. And I think I did a lot of that. I, did, I, I ignored what I was good at until, and I think it was because it just wasn't fun. When, you, when you're in school, your teachers are telling you what you need to write. And that takes all the fun out of it. Out of it. But once you get to a certain point in your life and you can actually control what you write and, and what you write about, and it makes it more fun, um, I think that's probably had a lot to do with it as well. But yeah, it's, it's some of it is serendipitous, but at the same time, your ambition kicks in as well. And you don't, you're always looking for something more because you're never, you never want to sit still. You never want to, because you're always going to be learning too. And when you feel like you've learned a lot from one place, then you've got to move on and, and learn something else. And that's how I've always been too, is, is I see something I want, I go for it. And then when I feel that I've, I've done as much as I possibly can with that, I'm looking to do more. I want to keep moving. I want to keep achieving and succeeding at whatever it is I'm doing. So it's, it's, it's a path that was sort of set up for me and I figured it out. And then once I figured it out, I didn't want to stop. I wanted to continue moving up that ladder or, or moving down that road. Elena, Jennifer, anything to add about being yeah. adaptive? 
Yeah, absolutely. I would just add to what Katya said, you know, stay open, keep moving, keep learning. I think it's Oscar Wilde who said, I'm not young enough to know everything, mm -hmm. right? And so the older I get, the more I realize there's so much still to learn. And um, I just feel really lucky to be, um, you know, an attorney, to be in our profession where you never know everything. There's always something new to learn and to keep changing and to keep evolving. Jennifer, okay, anything to yeah. add? Um, I mean, everyone really captured everything perfectly. I think the one thing we didn't really touch on too much though was networking. I'm not gonna go down a long spiel with that, but um, network, network, network. Like just get to know people, put yourself out there. That's how all, I think all of us got to this book. It was like, I'm just gonna start commenting on people's posts on LinkedIn. And then before I knew it, I became friends with them. And then Talar and I like just met at a spa out in Utah in February. I met my internet. It was like, a, it did not turn out to be a lifetime movie. We were we were all really <laughs> glad about that. Um, so don't hesitate to network and put yourself out there. I don't know if the audience, you know, it's probably a full spectrum of people, but we're all available. We're on LinkedIn, feel free to connect and, um, ask questions and that's what we're here for and just don't underestimate the power of like getting to know each, getting to know other lawyers I, I think I found that we all want to help I mean I'm sure there's somebody out there that's like I don't want to help you because nobody helped me but like I think like the women who wrote this book we did it because we don't want you walking both ways uphill in the snow <laughs> to your job we want to make it better for you I'm, I'm glad you brought us full circle back to the, the networking and mentoring aspect of it, because so many of these stories, and Talar, you talked about maintaining that relationship with someone you'd met early in your career and how that helped you come full circle. And I think again and again, that's a recurring theme throughout the stories um, of the book. And it's uh, women helping women. And uh, in many cases, like Talar and yours, it's it's a, a man who sponsors um, your career. So I, I wonder if you all could speak to that about um, specific mentorship, if that's relevant, you want to talk about it, how you're mentoring other people and the, the changing role of men in sponsoring and encouraging women, particularly in the legal profession, um, which is, uh, was historically so dominated by men. And then, um, you know, was, we all know law schools are, are now becoming majority uh, women, what that looks like going forward forward um like i said my you know my mentor my my sponsor uh was a man and you know in in my career i'm, I'm trying to think back i didn't i didn't have any female mentors um it was it was mostly men uh who were helping me uh but but even then it, it was about networking, you know, Fisher and Phillips. I don't, when I first started uh, in 92, they had five offices. I think they have a few hundred now around the country. Um, and I can't remember how many they had when I was a lawyer there, but a part of my networking was inter intra firm networking. I, I got to know the lawyers in the other offices and that's where a lot of my business came um was relationships i had made with lawyers from other offices who had a client with a california issue so they would call me and i would get the business and i would get the work when there was a lawyer departing and they wanted to hand over a client i'm the one who had a relationship with them um and you know i i think it's important to note that because i i don't want this to come across the the wrong way i did not meet and nurture relationships with people in my life with the plan of how can they help me one day? <laughs> um, and I, I have run across people like that, uh, especially online, and it's just so off-putting. Um, I, you know, my, my relationships have been as a result of genuine uh, interest and care and concern for people. There have been so many of them that I've been able to give to, and they haven't been able to give back to me, but I believe in karma and the universe. And, you know, even if it doesn't come from that same person, the universe has given back to me, uh, you know, tenfold. I mean, abundance has been chasing me like crazy. So, um, but, 
I I can't remember your question at all at this point because I've just <laughs> no that's okay you actually you you did a great job talking about mentorship and I think the big theme which is um, networking can be a really dirty word among lawyers we tend to think of it as a, some sort of weird gross transactional thing oh and the reality of it is it's it's about building those relationships right I I'm 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 envious of the of the twenty three. Uh, women uh, who came together to make this book because I'm sure like that in itself is a bonding experience. I mean, you all are, you all have these great um, connections now and it's, it's that kind of thing. And we talked about serendipity. It, it shouldn't be transactional. Um, it's about getting to know people and, and seeing, you know, what you can do and contribute to them. And, and then, um, and Star, you said it, it comes back in, in different and unexpected ways. It does. So and, um, there's just yeah, one more thing I want to say. Um, which let me know if I've reached my quota. I, I promise to stop talking. Um, but one of the things I, I have done to, I think it was Jennifer that pointed it out, just because I didn't have the resources and the female role models, I, I, I don't want to deprive others of it. Um, and I made an intentional point of finding mentees, especially on LinkedIn, especially minority women, uh, in other parts of the country so that I could lift them up with me. And I think I speak for my other panelists too, and, and we're wanting to do the same. And I think we are stronger together and we can do amazing things um, if we just band together. I mean, pretty soon we can take over the world. I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. I think that can really happen. So I know we're getting close to the end of our time. So I want to throw out uh, our last question that I hope each of you will answer. And it's this. Um, this book, I think, was largely written as a, as a way to inspire other women, especially younger women. And so I'm wondering if you could give advice to your younger selves um, about choosing your career path and defining ex, um, success, what would you tell her, aside from buying Apple stocks, Laura? So um, Elena, why don't we start with you? What would you, what would you tell your younger self um, as, as, as you started out your career? Just say, believe in yourself. It's all going to work out in the end. And if it hasn't worked out yet, it's not the end. Uh, Elena kind of hit the nail on the head with that one. Um, not to give up and don't beat yourself up. Give yourself some grace. Um, and try not to confine yourself to a box. And if you start to feel the box, like kick it down. You know, it's okay. You don't have to wait for other people to like get rid of it for you. Just like say you're whole, get out. <laughs> so, Talar? Um, two things I would tell her, you're allowed to change your mind and, and you should reevaluate regularly. And the second thing I would tell her, find your tribe, even though you don't have email yet, you don't have social media, um, go find a way to find your tribe. I wish I had this tribe of women, you know, 23 years ago, but oh, well. Katya, last word, what would you tell yourself um, as you were starting out? Okay, I would say first and foremost, believe in yourself. Secondly, don't be such a wuss. Uh, <laughs> and really just, when you have a, the voice inside you telling you something, listen to that voice. Don't ignore it. Um, that voice is telling you that you are more than what you think you are and you need to go out there and find yourself. Thank you for that. I want to thank all of our panelists today. They are four of the 23 authors in the anthology, Women in Law, Discovering the True Meaning of Success. I hope you will get a copy. And I, I probably failed to mention that um, proceeds of the book are going to another fabulous organization, uh, Miss JD. So um, another great accomplishment of the author. So thank you for joining us. I hope you will continue to follow the Center for Women in Law on all of our social media and join us in June for the next installment of our Ascend program, a wonderful workshop with um, Professor Ashley Willems on um, negotiating for more time 
And then we'll have a follow-up in August about deflecting power moves, and they are going to be absolutely great. So I hope you will join us for those. Um, in the meantime, thank you so much for your support of the Center for Women in Law. We couldn't do any of this without you. Thank you all so much. Thank you.